Great. Well, thank you everybody for being here tonight at the premiere panel on searching for wonder discussions and a deep dive into the play Imagining Heschel by Colin Greer, who is here with us tonight as well. And we're going to discuss the play from the perspective of the process of how we did it, from the perspective of uh, the actor's point of view. And the actors here, I think, did and went above and beyond normally what actors uh, are either asked to do or even uh, think about doing because we did some special traveling and we did some special thinking and uh, did a kind of in-depth look at the environment of the play. And uh, then we're going to show some scenes from the play. And maybe some of you have seen it already, maybe not. If you haven't, that's all right too. And we'll discuss the scenes from the play. And then when we have time, I think we will, uh, we'll stop at about uh, 15 after the hour and take any questions that you have about the play, about doing it, about what we talked about. So uh, this is a way for us not only to get into imagining Heschel, but it's also a way to uh, explore the ideas and, and not for it not just to be about an experience of a good piece of theater, which I think these incredible performers made for us, including Paul Carney. We have Paul Carney with us who did sound and music. We have Jason Mina who plays Jonah. We have Rick Richard Kautz who plays Cardinal Bea. We have Tom Luce who plays Heschel. We have Lindsay Palgi who plays Carol Radner, the interviewer. Uh, and we had Bailey Story, who's not with us tonight. He played uh, Father, um, oh, now I just blanked on the father's O'Malley, <laughs> O'Malley thank you. And um, then myself, I don't know if I introduced myself. I'm David Chack and I'm the director of the play. So we'll talk about it from all our perspectives as a group. But before we start with that, and I also wanna do some thank yous I'd like to also um, take a moment of um, remembering and the remembering is not that far away because it's in memory of a dear, dear friend of mine and of Bunbury as well, of Spiel, uh, Karen Edwards Hunter. And Karen died last week very suddenly. And uh, she worked with me and worked with Bunbury on the Green Book that we did last year and was an incredible presence here in Louisville in the Jewish community, in the African-American community, in the theater community. And I feel that this play that we're doing now not only is something that she would have very much wanted to be a part of. In fact, I asked her if she could be part of it back in, um, February, but she didn't think she was up to it. Um, but she would have, th it really embodies her spirit, her spirit of building bridges. I wrote a piece for her uh, in tribute to her that's going to be in the Jewish community newspaper uh, next week. And I was thinking how she was one of the first people I met when I came here to Louisville to work at the Jewish Community Center. And they put me with her right away because she was doing theater. She had just started a Jewish African-American theater company with children. And not only threw herself into that, but also uh, helped to expand it. And then her work with that theater company and with those children was so incredible that we made her a full-time worker at the JCC, working with middle school children and then she and I developed other programs and we even would take annual trips with these children and, and other children to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. She was an incredible person and not only will be sorely missed 
in our community, but I will miss her very much. So that's why, and I spoke with Phil, her husband, and he wholeheartedly agreed that this would be a great thing to honor her and to remember her through these panel discussions, which we will continue to have on Thursday nights. And uh, next Thursday night will be, uh, once again at 7.30, will be an examination of faith. Jewish Christian relations, a wonderful lineup again. Professor Asaf Angerman, visiting assistant professor of philosophy and Jewish thought here at the University of Louisville. Daniel Ashheim from the Israel Public Diplomacy Desk of the Consul General of Israel of the Midwest in Chicago. Rabbi Dr. Nadia Saritsky from Interfaith Paths to Peace. And Father Joe Graffis, a semi-retired priest now from the Archdiocese of Louisville, and also one of the original founders of the Jewish Roman Catholic Dialogue. So that will be next week. And then December 17th, um, once again, a Thursday night at 7.30, will be Social Justice from Jewish and Black Perspectives. It's still a bit in formation, but two people that we know for sure are coming are Sydney Edwards, it's a wonderful actor who started here in Louisville and went on to um, Ohio and just came back. And she's now head of African-American theater at University of Louisville. Uh, and Sarah Gottesman, who is a Jeremiah fellow with Bend the Ark, a Jewish partnership for justice. So we may have a couple more on that last one, but, uh, and we'll continue to send notices out about them. So please people tell your friends about the panels, tell your friends about the film. The film is uh, accessible through the Bunbury Theater website as part of the Bunbury Spiel Identity Theater Project. And uh, it's on a pay-per-view basis. So as soon as you start viewing it, you have 48 hours uh, to continue to watch it or to watch it again. So now we have not only our wonderful uh, people with us uh, who were in the play, but also I need to thank uh, the people and sponsors that made it possible. Uh, uh, one of our major sponsors is the Jewish Heritage uh, Foundation for Excellence here in Louisville. Uh, they've become a very close partner of ours and we're really pleased that they joined in really in a way that was beyond what many foundations do. They, they encouraged us to continue our work in this time of pandemic. And when I told them that we had to do some extraordinary things to do that, they said, um, great, we'll, we'll be there to help you. And I also want to thank um, the Fund for the Arts, which is a major contributor to Bunbury Theater. And then our community partners, once again, the Midwest Israel Consulate and um, and the Ark, uh, the contingent here in Louisville, Jews for Justice. So um, I think those are all my thank yous, uh, other than the wonderful people that are here in front of you, our actors who I introduced. And uh, I want to start with really a, a very simple question. Why Heschel? Why should we think about doing a play about Heschel, either from the time, you know, Colin, you worked on this play for many years. I came in on it, I think about five or six years ago, but uh, you had worked on it a number of years before that and had had some staged readings of it, one of which was with Richard Dreyfus, and uh, then did some other readings as well. So then what was it about Heschel that drew you to the subject and then for all of us to think about why Heschel now? So Colin, if you could kind of lead it off for us. Yeah, thanks David. And thank you all for the work you've done on the play to make it um, what it is now. Um, so thanks, I wish I could have been in Louisville when you were working on it. Um, so it's a difficult, it's a simple question, but a very complicated answer because you know, there's never a one or rarely a one-to-one -one cause and effect between an idea and a play. Um, it grows out of a kind of intuition. 
So to be able to talk about why Heschel, uh, I have to start with why Heschel was and has long been important to me. Um, and that's a very simple kind of autobiographical answer. That's my grandfather. Um, my Zeta was a man of enormous piety. And when I read Heschel, I felt like I was re-meeting my grandfather. And so in a sense, I was writing a play that integrated an intellectual understanding and an intimate relationship that came from childhood and sitting in a synagogue with my grandfather uh, every single week for two days um, and then spending the Sabbath with him all day. Um, so um, that level of piety is what drew me to Heschel. Um, I never met him, but I felt it in the writing um, and wanted to put it together. Um, what, what I think powerfully drew me to him in that moment um, back eight, nine years ago was um, the heartbreaking this division that was happening between black and Jewish activists. Um, where there had been, when I first came to the United States, there had been a very close relationship and it gradually was fraying. And it felt to me like it was a manipulated fraying, but effective nevertheless. And I wanted to address it. And, um, you know, the famous picture of Heschel with King um, at Selma was kind of a stimulus to, well, maybe I can speak to this moment through this man who I care so much about. Um, and his commitment to love um, over and above um, rational discourse. It's in the poetry, it's in the beautiful language that he finds, it's in his sensibility with respect to others. That poetry um, and the love in it uh, made me feel that here's, here's someone that can speak to the time, that we cannot resolve the problems that are now facing our respective communities through rational discourse alone. We have to be able to trust in love. And it seemed to me Heschel was making that call. Um, and then I tried to explore through Heschel relationships between Jews and other groups that make up American society. Yeah, I, well, I, you know, I have some clips uh, queued up and I thought maybe I would show some clips and we can continue because what you just said just fits so nicely with the very first one, which is at the beginning of the play. So if people don't mind, I wanna jump into that and then we can bring everybody else into the conversation. So why don't we see a clip and I'll go to screen share and pull that up. And here we have the very beginning of the play, not the prelude where we have uh, Heschel beginning to pray in the morning but we have the very beginning where Heschel is lecturing to the Jewish Theological Seminary students. Good morning. I was almost late to class this morning. When I went to the elevator, a neighbor, her name is Louise, wanted to tell me about how grateful she is for the new radiators in our building. I am sorry to those I have kept waiting. We have spoken before of Father Bertrand. Remember, he is the Christian missionary from whose book I read to you. They said to me, don't go to the shanties. You will find only whores and sun-baked poverty. I went anyway. And 10 years later, I reported back, poverty persists hard as clay. But I have not yet met a whore. There is no other, my friends. The other is a fragment of our fears. So we will read this man's experience and discuss it from a Jewish perspective. Yes, yes, I know. This is the reflection of a Christian brother serving in a Christian mission. Any more than the women around him in Bangladesh were whores. Let me tell you a personal story about my neighbor Louise that may help you find the freedom to open yourselves to this man's great humanity, to find a little bit more of yourselves than you are used to. So each morning, I go down in the elevator and we stop at the third floor. A woman named Louise always gets on and says to me, good morning, Alan. Now, 
as you well know, my name is not Alan. This started about four years ago. Uh, but anyway, she says, good morning, Alan. By now, I actually look forward to her and to my being called Alan. Why? Because I feel a certain freedom when she calls me Alan. For a few seconds, I am free of the identity I carry with me as Abraham. I do not feel mistaken or, or misidentified. Rather, I am reminded of how I might be different or even more than whom I have become. I am reminded that who I am is open to discovery as well as to recognition. So I'm gonna pause that there. And I just want to, first of all, recognize Tom Luce for the wonderful job he does in this monologue and, and throughout the entire uh, production and the entire film, which we did so many times with so many takes from so many different angles. Uh, but also the writing here, which I think is not only exquisite, but does exactly what a really great play does. I mean, within the very beginning of this piece, I hope I'm not embarrassing you, Colin, mm. but uh, within the beginning basically is everything that the play is about. It's all here, social justice and interfaith dialogue Jewish identity and questions of Jewish identity, and then the very personal nature of Heschel, not minding that he's called Alan, and that he has a relationship with this woman that is a very special relationship because that's what she does. She calls him Alan. Uh, and and it, he also says, and I think this is a great line, who I am, is open to discovery as well as to recognition. And then it goes on also about the relationship between Jews and African-Americans. So right here within this whole beginning is the entire play. Uh, I love this beginning, Colin. I just think it's so great because it's not, you know, it's not just teaching the students. Clearly that's what's, you know, the action there, but it's, telling us everything that the play's about right from the start. Yeah. Your, your thoughts on that. My thoughts are that I, I love that you love it. I mean, I, um, he, he's, um, what he goes on to say to Jewish students is that they can, they can learn more about themselves. They can be more than what, what the stereotypically they have become. Um, that there's a world out there that requires a perforation of their being in order to be met. They can't meet the world simply by being rigid figures. They have to take their learning and, and, and run it through their hearts and reach out to the world. And he demonstrated that. And I was trying to, as you say, capture that at the beginning of the play because there's hardship in the play and there's his, his anger. Um, he's likened to King Saul twice in the play um, because he has he has an angry fiber but but inside of it and uh, and and fueling it is a tremendous capacity for deep emotion and great love mm -hmm. yeah what was that like for you tom to embody heschel wow uh no <laughs> yeah well it, it, it was it was it was great because it was uh like i said there was there's such a a love in him um and, and you know my 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 formative years were the 1960s so you know i grew up in the you know civil rights was you know huge and demonstrations and the vietnam war and all that was going on and uh so that affected me very deeply and i and i'm in some ways i'm glad to see that that is being revisited these days uh because i think we kind of forgot what what that was and what could be accomplished by uh by speaking out speaking out with love and and you know and and change you, you can you you know change the world basically i, I think we, we found that in the 60s and i think we can you know do that again and that's i think what what you know his message embodies yeah what i mean we can open this up to the to the rest of the 
uh, actors here, what are some of your thoughts after just seeing this first scene, even though you're not in it? I know, you know, you're waiting for your scene, but <laughs> what about, what about this? What do you think about this? Um, I would say that it kind of introduces us. And for me, it introduces the idea of Heschel and his openness and his um, compassion for other people. Because in my character's arc, that's something that's extremely important. And I feel like it's established pretty early on that there's no um, question about whether Heschel's going to cross the bridge and be a um, friend to Jonah. I feel like it's established that Heschel is just compassionate towards everybody. And Heschel understands that love shouldn't be relegated to certain people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also think that there is something about Heschel where not only it shouldn't be relegated to certain people, but it needed to be expanded upon. It needed to draw in others. It couldn't just be the love or the social justice for one particular group. Yeah. I think um, we see that in the interfaith uh connections that he has and in the dialogue that he has i mean there are a few dialogues that he has with cardinal bea uh so why don't i go to that scene uh and go to a sheen a screen share there hold on a second and uh move this cursor to 21 and we'll skip that very first part move in a little bit We'll go to 2132. Well, why don't we just start here? Uh, so now they go to Riverside Park, and actually, our actors all went to Riverside Park. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Colin, we actually did a field trip to New York City back in December. So here we are, Riverside Park at Heschel's favorite tree. This is the one. Well, it, it is a beautiful tree. A beautiful tree and a good friend. I visit this friend almost every day. I sit here and we talk. If this tree could understand Yiddish or Hebrew, it would know the deepest parts of me. Ah, oh, but I think we all need more than a tree to be truly known. We need God for that, Bea. Yes. Oh, I am pleased to meet your tree. Do I hear a German accent, Bea? Yes, I spoke German as a boy, like yourself. Uh, not exactly like me. I doubt you were like me. Well, did you invite me here because your tree has something to say to me and Pope John? Look, Bea, you see, this tree is very old. You see, it has survived. Survival is a very powerful force, Bea. So this Pope will turn to defend the Jews? He will reject one of the foundational pillars of the church. Every time a Jew is insulted or attacked because of the church, it is too many. But your tree does not stand here alone, Abraham. If a fire starts in the grass, the tree would burn down and with it all the trees around it. One man's hatred for that tree can destroy a whole forest. Oh, so only the tree is guilty? Is that the message you want to give me? Uh, no, what I have written is that all may not be guilty, but all are responsible. Trust my very, very deep commitment. We have a chance to profoundly change the church, Abraham. We have an historical opening, a radical change with this Pope. Oh, Heschel, in between us, there can be trust and peace. I believe we can repair the world. Oh, Heschel, the, the Pope has asked me to. He felt a kindred spirit in you. Well, he is especially moved by your recent letter urging President Kennedy to make civil rights a priority in his administration. He quotes it often. Well, not to drink what other humans drink. What a sacrilege of God's creation. But my letter to the president? The Pope has already seen it in Rome? In Italian? Oh, we need you in Rome, Heschel. So, will you come to Rome? After Selma. I will come after I join my good friend Martin in Selma. <laughs> mm. 
Okay, we'll stop there before we get into acid rock here. So, uh, <laughs> Rick, what was what was that like for you? Why don't Why don't we bring you into this now a little bit more? And 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 also, you're a minister as well, right? I am uh, now a retired Episcopal priest, okay. which is very co close to Catholic, uh, uh, sort of Catholic light. I think we have been described. Um, <laughs> It, it's interesting because uh, on one hand, if you look at just one side of Heschel um, about love and about inclusivity and breaking down walls, which uh, the comment is why Heschel now is because we have so many walls that are going up and becoming more fortified in America. Walls that separate and divide and Heschel uh, very strongly tried to tear those walls down. But the other side of Heschel which comes forth in this uh, seen is that um, all are responsible, that it's not, it's not cheap grace, it's not uh, a you know, get out of jail free card from God, that we are responsible for our actions and we are responsible for and to one another. And um, it, it's in that balance of grace and unconditional love, along with the sense that we are connected and um, are obligated uh, uh, to be accountable to one another, I think is part of the powerful message that, that Heschel has brought through his life and, and that you're elucidating in this, uh, in this story that Colin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this was a very, just historically speaking now, this is a very, very important moment in not only Jewish Christian relations, but really in the world. Uh, Colin, maybe you could, you're a historian as well, Colin, maybe you could speak a little bit more about this moment at this time. Uh, well, the Vatican Council um, was a reformation of the Catholic Church that tried to bring it into the, the 1960s. Um, it, didn't, it didn't structurally change the church it changed the church's style of meeting the rest of the world. So it was a moment of time in which there was a Pope and, and a Heschel that had a, a similar opening to the world. Um, Heschel, Heschel was obviously not bound by the institutional structure, um, but nevertheless, there was a meeting. But at the same time, the 1960s were not that long after the, the Holocaust and the dropping of the atomic bomb and the world had seen horrific things, um, which was part of the readiness for the climax of the civil rights movement as it was in that moment. Um, no more suffering, let's stop this, let's, let's find our humanity. Um, and that was, a, that was bubbling in America. That's why Heschel was one of the founders, the clergy and lady concerned about the war in Vietnam. He was a civil rights activist, he was an anti-war activist, and he was also chosen to try to repair this relationship with the Catholic Church. And it's a delicate one because in that moment, the church was in fact opening itself up to change, but there hadn't really been a full accounting for the church's role in the Holocaust. And it, Heschel was taking that on. It was a massive undertaking. In the play, he talks something about his fears in, in having to do that. Um, and of course, what he encounters is disappointment. Um, a great friendship is built, but it's, it's threatened by the disappointment. And he meets in the person of another, another, another priest who's Irish, a version of what is, was happening in America. That is that gradually out of the civil rights movement, a, ra a racialization of white identity began to happen too. The, the white South and then a white, white America racialized its white identity, which is what we confront now. Um, and that confrontation was expressed through the figure of an Irish priest. But what about us? You know, we folks who have been struggling all our lives, the majority of your membership, whether it be the Catholic Church or the nation state, it, are being left behind because you want to make change. So who pays the price for change? How, how much are the people who pay that price to be admitted as partners in the choice? Or do they have to just bury their their own culture and experience and, and adapt. Um, so how, how the, the challenge I think that I would like the play to represent is how do we reach across the boundaries and not simply demand that people change, 
but rather invite them in through respectful dialogue. And you also juxtapose that with the formation of the state of Israel. Yes. And, and the, 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 it's a brief discussion, uh, although it, there was more to it in, in another version of the play, uh, but in this version, it's a brief discussion, but still it's a discussion that then starts to shift how the Vatican is responding to Heschel. Yeah, because it's a geopolitical enterprise. And mm -hmm. it's, it's answerable to a, a number of different uh, constituencies. Mm -hmm. But I, there's a line that Heschel uses that I think is not his line, but I, it came to me because of, I think I understood something about him. He, he understood the limits of his own understanding. So he says that he has no unified theory of peace. I have mm. no unified theory of peace. I believe in peace. I'm committed to peace. I don't have a theory that makes me always consistent with my belief in peace. That I, that I will err. I have, a, I, have a, I have a temper. I have commitments that demand my, my allegiance. And there are contradictions. Yeah, I also think, I mean, uh, uh, Rick um, landed on a line that for me, I've been thinking about as well in light of what's going on today, relating it to today now, where he has that very famous line, um, not all are guilty, but all are responsible. And I wonder if that's something that we really think about today, or are we just pointing our fingers and saying, you all are guilty. Do you know what I mean? I do. I mean, it's very yeah, and, I, hard. It's, it's yeah, very and hard. I'm interested in everybody's uh, yeah. thinking on that. Yeah, I won't be long, but it's, it's a very hard challenge. I mean, to actually believe deeply in what you are committed to, and at the same time, recognize the humanity of those who oppose you is very difficult. And we're seeing a real challenge to that goal right now. Um, it's manipulated to a high degree, but it's a real human mm -hmm. struggle. Uh, Heschel understood that, I think, on a very personal level. So that was, you know. Yeah. And I think also there's this, you know, um, it's not a knee-jerk reaction. It's not. It's, it's a reaction that comes from some very deep wounds and some di very deep hurt. But there is a reaction of blaming as many people as possible. All those people who voted for Trump. I can't believe what those people did. I can't believe what all the white people do. I can't believe what all Antifa does. You know, everybody, whoever that is, by the way, that's like you say, manipulated as well. But there's this lack of really thinking about how, you know, and I think he thought about it, especially from the point of view of Jews and Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. I don't, th and Wiesel, Elie Wiesel used to say this all the time to us. He does not believe in, did not believe in collective guilt. Mm -hmm. He believed that those that actually did the murdering were responsible for what they did. And those that aided, clearly aided and abetted them were responsible for what they did. But that, or and we're guilty. We're guilty people. We're guilty, and they need they did crimes, and they needed to serve for those crimes. But that that didn't mean that everybody wasn't responsible. I mean, people by not responding were responsible. Right. I think that's um, partly expressed through Hesher's relationship with Jonah. Um, Jonah is a young black man who is enormously angry. Um, and for me, that anger was necessary to portray because to a very great extent, until, until now, um, where, it's, where we're getting a, a, a rebirth of the fury, American, African-Americans have been enormously restrained. In fact, our culture owes a great debt to African-Americans generation after generation being restrained in their anger of their oppression. Um, it's way past time for that restraint to have some, some mitigation, but we owe it a great debt. And in the play, Jonah is really erupting with impatience about that. But he also expects Heschel to meet him halfway 
because Heschel has experienced the Holocaust. And he's basically saying, how could you not understand the world the way I do? Right? We, we, we have a similar experience. Um, I expect you to understand. And Heschel is basically saying, I don't want you to become one of those people. So Go that's ahead. exactly the clip I have ah. queued up right now. <laughs> so let's get to that. And um, then we can talk about that some more. And that is, give me a second, not long into this. Uh, about here. Here we have Jonah with Heschel. And Jonah is driving Heschel to LaGuardia. Why are you crying? I cry for the little boy who invites his shoulder to be pounded to protect himself from a bully. It must have hurt, the pounding. Forget it, we're almost at the airport. Jonah, I would like to talk some more about this when I return from Rome. Sure, if I'm here. Well, you're going somewhere? I may be gone. I'll probably be in the service. What, in the army? What, to, to fight? I know my dad wouldn't want it. But I just picture him coming up to me, putting his arms around me. Real tight, real close. He wouldn't try to stop me. He'd just put his arms around me. But you want to be in the war? Even Muhammad Ali, the champion boxer, says no to war. So I should listen to what he does? Do you know Muhammad Ali is a Muslim? It's good that his Muslim faith guides him to peace. I see a difference, sir. Have you been drafted, Jonah? I am enlisting. Jonah, I think maybe it was meant for us to talk together like this today. You are teaching me something I did not know about you. You want to hear my poem, Rabbi? <clears throat> it's not a secret, sir, that I am angry. From kick my ass Tennessee to kiss my ass New York, if someone who looks like me laughs at the wrong time, he's dead. For everybody in pain in the butt pig style Harlem to you shitting me, Mississippi, whites will Negro me as soon as I kick up dust. That's me talking, writing, Mr. Heschel. Jonah Barnes, poet at large. <laughs> Don't enlist, Jonah. Okay. So here we have exactly what you mentioned, Colin, this yeah. anger, but an anger that's coming from a very deep and legitimate place. Uh, so we have Jason with us. Tell us what you think of this moment for you. Um, I'd say it was difficult just because for Jonah, this is something he wants so bad. He doesn't know anywhere, any other way to get this kind of um, change, this kind of movement. Like he has, he has to get it out somehow. And this is the only way he knows. And um, Heschel wants to meet him at this place and kind of get him at a, at a more peaceful place because that's where Heschel is. Heschel kind of understands it from a place of compassion and from a place of everyone is, um, not everyone, you can't say this group is all responsible. Everyone, we need to come together in peace. But um, Jonah hasn't found any, um, he hasn't found anything from that. He hasn't found anything from being peaceful with people. He's been restrained his whole life. Yeah, was that something that, I mean, you know, I don't know if this is something you were thinking about. I knew we were going down to some of the protests mm -hmm. uh, for Breonna Taylor. And I was just wondering if, if any of this entered into your thinking or, or maybe not, but, but thinking about it now, reflecting on it now. Yeah, I would say it definitely, um, I was definitely in the times. <laughs> it felt uh, oddly reminiscent going down to protests. And I would say, yeah, definitely brought, um, I brought some of that into it just because that anger, it's so timely and it's so tragically still relevant. It's kind of sad I didn't have to go that far to find it again. It was so amazing for me when I heard how the Kentucky police 
were being trained with manuals that had quotes from Hitler in Mein Kampf. It's just horrible that this was part of the manual up until I think 2016 or 17. And thankfully these incredible students at Manual High School, Manual, was it Manual or, or Mail? I think Mail uh, found that they were doing some reporting on something else. And then they discovered this. And, you know, all of Kentucky went, what, what, is this really true? And that the violence that's being used in the police force is not only systemic, but it's something that's being borrowed, or at least the, the ways to think of using that violence is being borrowed from Nazism. Yeah. So here we see these overlays. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I was just wondering in terms of playing, I mean, we had you in a, a couple of roles where in a sense you're angry, but I think still the anger is coming from a place of incredible uh, um, desire for change. Yeah. It's not a desire to be angry, to just destroy things. Yeah, a lot of um, what I thought about was his relationship with his father and how um, even though he knows his father wouldn't have wanted the things that he does, I think in his decision to enlist, he's thinking about his father and he's thinking about his family and he that's all he really wants is to see change and to make sure that he can live a life and see that change manifest. Yeah. I mean, can I show this one scene from the uh, nightmare sequence? Uh, just have a minute of it. I don't want to show too much to, of it. And, and I want to get to the scene of the interviewer uh, because I think that's just so interesting to see a, a kind of uh, very different way of looking at everything that's going on. But uh, let me get to just a little bit of this nightmare sequence. Here we go. Killed people. And saved some lives. Oh, saving lives is good. Kill people too. Oh, you killed people? I'm so sorry. And when the stars won't come to be counted, I'll count the holes they leave. That's Amiri Baraka. The man who wants to kill white people. And this makes sense to you? We must build bridges. You know we must build bridges. I'm Jonah. And you're Rabbi Amir Kahane of the Jewish Defense League. I blew up bridges and now. I'm not Kahana. What do you know of Kahana? It doesn't matter, Rabbi. This is a dream. You have a bronze star. But not a purple heart. So the purple heart is better? Sure is. It's the white badge of courage. Oh, you are so full of hate, my boy. Jonah! Oh, now you hate me. You come to tell me you hate me? I come to tell you, Reverend Dr. Cocker. I'm changing my name and I'm out of here. I have a name for you. Call yourself Isaac. It means he who laughs. Okay, let's uh, stop share there. I also want to do a shout out uh, not only to Paul who did sound effects and also the uh, a lot of the some of the edits that we needed, but also to Video Bread and uh, Raphael Cecil who was our lead person at Video Bread, who did incredible filming for us. That nightmare sequence was just so, so well. <laughs> it was so incredible. And I spoke to a couple of people who said they really freaked them out. Uh, but yeah, I'm wondering, Jason, what was that like for you to, to do that scene? Um, it was amazing, first of all. Uh, it was really, really cool. but. Um, I think it was interesting to approach the character from how we talked about as Heschel's, a part of Heschel's imagination, which is because this is Heschel's dream. This is Heschel's interpretation of Jonah's anger. And um, I think it was interesting to approach it from Heschel's point of view and the difference between 
how Jonah is really expressing himself versus what Heschel doesn't want him to become. Yeah, and, and also I think, you know, we talk about pandemics. I mean, this is the pandemic of fear that leads to anger, that leads to hate, yeah. that then becomes a pandemic that, uh, I mean, those of us who remember the Vietnam War remember this time period where uh, we really, we, we were also at each other the way we're seeing some groups are at each other again. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then the, so many people in Vietnam who were killed, so many people who were gassed, so many people who were um, you know, killed for no reason. Uh, I, I want to get to the uh, interviewer scene because this gets us, I mean, a lot of this is coming really from the gut, uh, which is what's so incredible about this, but it's also uh, uh, about the play, but it's also comes from a very intellectual perspective as well. And um, the interviews, and Colin, you can fill us in more, um, were based on a, a series of interviews that Heschel did with Carl Stern on uh, CBS, I think, is that correct? I think so. Well, why don't we see just uh, a couple of minutes of this. And this is an interview with um, Carol Radner now, we changed it a little bit, but to have this kind of intellectual give and take uh, that is in the uh, film that we did, it's not on camera yet, uh, but it's as though it could be on camera. Successful Jewish writers, both blacklisted, destroyed by Senator Joseph McCarthy. This is true. McCarthy claimed they were communists. Like you, Rabbi, I have my own demons, and yet my family survives. My cousins are flourishing here in America. Meanwhile, could you say that your work has made a difference and had a measurable effect on their lives? Are the Russians changing their anti-Semitic policies towards Jews, and have they stopped wielding their power over other minorities? Doesn't this make America stand above your criticism? What if they win and we lose? First, there are no guarantees. There is only faith and there is work. Those are our obligations, to find faith and to do the work that we must do. What, I bore you? I said what is expected, so it is of no interest? No, I'm just trying to frame a, a tricky question. Oh, so you want to trick me, hmm? <laughs> no, not at all. I, uh, I'm wondering if you know anything about gardening. Do you know anything about weeding? No, not really. I am not a gardener. I probably have a black thumb. <laughs> the weeds in a wildly overgrown garden have to be yanked out of the ground. They are invasive and deeply rooted. So they must be torn up aggressively. What brains we have, Miss Radner. The sharpness of the human mind is a wonderful thing. So, because I can pull a weed, it is okay then by the same right to take a life? Like eager children, their hands are raised in a black fist. Some of the black fist in a Star of David, like Rabbi Meir Kahana's Jewish Defense League. Who do they salute? This shocks you, Rabbi but I see it as inevitable. They salute the flag of stand your ground, of never again, of your dead bodies are better than our dead bodies. Yes, the Nazis, oppressors, grow. They grow weeds, as you call them. They grow in any soil. Any people can grow Nazis. No people are all weeds. Miss Radner, I ask that you and your viewers to pay attention to the faces, to the faces. Just okay, we'll stop there. Pay attention to the faces. I love that. Uh, yeah, Lindsay, what are your thoughts on doing this scene and how you approach Carol Radner? You're on mute, it's okay. <laughs> there we go. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, uh, this was very profound. This was very, 
I don't want to say I, it was difficult in in the kind of way that um, that something very necessary is difficult because I think these conversations need to be had and explored in our current climate. To Colin's point earlier um, and in the play, we we all are responsible, and I think that for Carol. And, and her place of pain, she's gotten away from, from the humanity of looking at the faces. To have the opportunity to discuss that and explore that from an artistic point of view, which is not my personal point of view, was very illuminating. And um, I, I hope that answers your question. It, it was a lot, it was very important, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think also the way you, first of all, as the actor, approached this was on a really um, powerful level. It was a woman who was a journalist who wanted to make something of herself, who really saw these interviews as an important moment in her career. And then it personally affects her because she has family members who were blacklisted in her her mother and father were blacklisted in the McCarthy era and yet she wants to make it as a Jewish woman in America maybe even forgetting the fact that she's a Jew maybe even you know not taking that fully into account which is you know also something that we see in you know people in in some administrations they're about to leave where there are all these Jews that are doing things to immigrants and forgetting the fact that their families were immigrants and yeah. were fleeing Nazi Germany and then they're doing to immigrants what might have been done to them yeah there's amount of fear involved in all of that David um you know Heschel um, talks a little bit about later the the Jews in the South that want him not to come south with King because having a Jew involved in the civil rights movement at a leadership level would threaten their security in the South. Um, and I think that's similar here that um, Radner doesn't want to be put into a sense of forced security by what she would think of as kind of the lovey-dovey Hesher. There's a, there's a real politique out there, and she wants to be on the winning side of that. She's tired of being on the losing side. Yeah, yeah. She, she seeks strength, and she believes herself to be strong, and she's ready to prove it no matter what. Yeah. So I just, I, I want to be able to take, uh, we don't have too many people here live, but we are recording this actually as well, and we're going to be posting the link on the website so people will be able to do this and enjoy the discussion that I'm very much enjoying. In fact, I can't believe we've gone, um, you know, pretty much an hour, uh, but to take some time for questions and uh, people can uh, type them in the chat or what's another way they can do it, Paul? Is there any other options? Um, I am, I'm trying to give everybody the option right now to unmute. Uh, oh, okay. So to, to speak, they would be able to. Okay, well, uh, speak softly, but carry a big no. Um, some people have to leave right now. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you don't have to leave and stick around for a few more minutes and we'll go to at least uh, 8.30. But uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you or to type questions in the chat. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that people are being able to see relationships to things that are going on today. For me, this is very powerful because not only of the figure of Heschel, uh, both from a social justice perspective, but also from a faith perspective. And we'll talk about this some more next week, but it, it's just uh, comes up a lot in classes that I teach where people often think that faith is something that has to uh, kind of come to you or you live it, but it's not something that you necessarily do. 
and that it doesn't necessarily lead to social justice. And um, I know, once again, we'll talk about this more next week, but I think that this is an important part of Heschel's life, is that faith was, and, and prayer, he, would, he, he said prayer was a, a form of protest, uh, which is often what people don't think about prayer being. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, just what so, makes Heschel so relevant for today. And also what brings him so close to the black community, because I think that prayer and Christianity is another way to um, feel like one is going into freedom. You know, that that's, I know that's what Karen Edwards Hunter and I would talk about you know, just the relationship between Jews and Blacks and how we have this history of looking for freedom and that that's very much embedded in our theology. You know, the story of Jews coming out and being slaves in Egypt. And that's a story that Black people embody in this country and took that on. And, you know, Moses was Harriet Tubman. David, I have a question. Great, Felice, I see you. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I just would like to know, you might have written this in some of the description before, but now that I've seen it, um, how much of all the dialogue and those quotes and things like that at the beginning of each sort of uh, chapter, how much is actually um, Heschel's words himself? I'll leave that to our playwright. The, 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 um, the claptions are all Heschel. Yeah, I figured, yeah. Ex- but and except for um, direct quotes from his books that come occasionally in the play, nothing is his. Oh, or okay. Inspired by him. Oh. Like the monologues are all yours, yeah. Colin. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting because it, you know, it feels like Heschel. <laughs> Thank you. It really does feel like that. <laughs> so that's, that's very interesting. I wanted to also say, as long as I'm talking, um, <laughs> I just want to say to Thomas that um, I found that you were very believable in even the way you, your eyes, you, you were using your eyes. I mean, sometimes it's hard to, I think, look like you're really emotionally the, 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 the character. But I felt your eyes particularly were, were stunning in that way. I felt like you really were showing, like when you looked at Jason or you, or you looked at uh, you know, any of the other characters that it, it, it was telling in your eyes too. So I, I think that was, I think you did a great job there. Oh, thank you. It was a very, very high compliment. And it was, uh, when, when you have good words to say to them, it makes it much, much easier to, wow. to connect to them in, in, a, in a real and deep way. So yeah. well, thank you. Thanks. This kind of gets a little bit to the process as well, which was very strange in this time of COVID and our rehearsals and, you know, and everything we did had to be done very quickly. We shot the film over three days in two locations and were tried to be as distant as possible. Uh, evidently it succeeded because everybody's here and we're not sick, thank God. <laughs> and, uh, and then we had our masks on when we were rehearsing, but we had very little time to rehearse actual face-to-face. And the uh, ability for people not only to be there, but then just to land the lines, you guys were so great. And uh, it was just a pleasure to work with you. It was a pleasure to work with real professionals. You were great. So we're at our hour, uh, pretty much. And I wanna be respectful of that also because we're recording and people will be seeing this on a recorded basis as well. David, can I just say a quick thing? Um, yes, please. You said something about prayer, and I think it's, um, it's profound. It's worth saying that, um, that one of the reasons why 
I believe Heschel thought of prayer so significantly, in addition to having grown up praying, um, is that prayer is, um, is about humility. That you actually cede your own powerlessness and take new strengths. Um, and I think one of the problems that we have as, a, as activists on whatever side of the aisle is that we don't have a, much humility. Um, and um, I'm reminded that uh, the, the French Jewish philosopher Jacques Derrida, um, who was sort of thought of as an atheist, um, wrote in one of his later pieces that he would go to bed every night, before he went to bed every night, he would kiss the sisters on his talus. And he did it not because he was a man of faith, but because he believed that he needed to exercise humility. And, um, and I think that's a, an important thing, aspect of prayer, that it reminds us of the limitations and also the heights that we can reach. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I remember us talking about that actually when we were fleshing out some of the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I remembered reading at the time how Heschel said, it, in too many ways, we've lost the ability to feel shame. And he didn't mean this in a way that shame, oh, you're a bad person, right. but a sense of humility and, and to feel like I truly need to feel ashamed for what I did because what I did needs to be fixed and made better. I need to look at myself. There needs to be a sense of forgiveness and we need to share that with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, on that note, I think we've had a great evening together and we have more to come. We have next week an examination of faith, Jewish Christian relations with some really great panelists. And the week after that, social justice from Jewish and black perspectives. So please, you're welcome to join us, have a viewing party, get a few other people that you know, friends, call them up and bring yourself a glass of wine. I know I will, <laughs> and uh, we can. Uh, you can have a little fun together too. And and you know, one of the really, as someone said on a Zoom call that I was on today, it's taken this time of isolation to create something through these Zoom meetings, where we're actually more in touch with people in certain ways than we've ever been before yeah so it's it's quite a quite a time and yet i'm still i'm waiting for that vaccine and i'm i'm first in line <laughs> yeah. <I'm> first. <laughs> yeah yeah so everybody uh thank you very much thank you, thank you all for joining yeah. us and uh we're gonna have a little just if the uh panelists could stay on a little bit longer and uh and everybody else who's not a panelist uh will See you guys later and stay in touch. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.